emptiness is the the the, the type of uh, seeing that we're we're after, and, and we're um, trying to um, we're trying to formulate, you know, that that view of emptiness. But first, it helps to really soften that sense of self, and that sense of self is something that we. That, ha that softens on its own for many of us, but we, a lot of times we just don't notice what is happening. You know? So when we're very happy, um, there's a not much sense of self you know, happening there, and when, we're, um, when we just kind of seemingly flow through life, there's no uh, like a sense of self that gets, gets, let things get sticky. And a lot of it has to do with grasping, right? I mean, we talked about that quite a bit, uh, and attachment, and how when we attach on to things, it's almost like it kind of bogs us down, and the, the self is very evident. It's there. Uh, we, if we get attached to anything, you know, if somebody puts us down, particularly says something to us that we don't care for, or something that attacks us personally, the, sen the, the sense of self is definitely there, right? I mean, we can feel that. And then when we're walking through nature, for example, and we have nothing to protect, you know, we're very, we feel very thankful to be alive and we're just enjoying ourselves, very little sense of self happening there. And so a lot of this is two different views of, of there's the view of looking at the world and working with the world and seeing, you know, that, that these experiences happening and then us kind of going, going into this experience like, I'm going to join this experience and be a part of what is happening out there. And then there's the other view that everything that is happening out there is happening in relation to how I perceive it, my perception. So I'll... So basically, things out there don't have as much meaning or any meaning until uh, until that until we process it. So in in those terms, all of that all of the phenomena out there is empty, except for how when we when we process it ourselves. So that's one, one view of emptiness. And the other, another view of emptiness that we talked about, I think, last week was the, the emptiness of, of um, individual existence. And that's one of the first things that uh, when people have this realization of emptiness, this, this, the emptiness of individual existence is the first thing that comes along uh, after the, the dropping away of the self. And, and this individual existence means that, and we already touched on this before too, but it's very important for us to, to, to grasp it, that, that we, we don't stand on our own without, first of all, without our parents coming together. You know, the, the sperm and the egg came together and created this, this stuff, you know, this body. And the, our parents wouldn't have been a part of it if their parents, our grandparents, didn't come together and formulate them. So it's all these different conditions, and, and so on and so forth, all the way down history, all these different conditions that come together to, to create this. So we, and we, sit, we feel as if we're an individual, you know, that individual existence. But it, we're dependent on everything else, not only our parents, but, but everything in the world. All the different, you know, what did you eat yesterday? That food, you're dependent on that food. Where did that food come from? Think of the manufacturing process of a can of beans. You know, the, who made the metal? Where did the beans come from? Who watered it? Who, where did the seeds come from? You know, just one bean itself. <laughs> you know, what all, everything that went into that one bean, and then we eat it, and we don't think anything of it. But it's, it's all of these conditions come together to, to, formulate, to formulate this. So in that respect, we are completely empty of individual existence. We, don't stand, we can't stand alone and say that we are separate from the rest of the world. It's just 
it's impossible to do. Although we we do it because of our conditioning. Our conditioning is a is a big part of this, and uh, especially you know especially uh, in the West, we're very much conditioned to um, have this. Well, first of all, you know the belief in heaven and hell. You know if we. Uh, that there is not, uh, you know, any kind of rebirth or uh, anything like that. That that the, the the soul stays the same, and it just goes into this category or this category. This one's cool, and this one's hot. You know, the the heaven and hell thing. And so we're we're fed that as children, and our parents were fed that too. And um, uh, you know, it's the European and American view of of how we live. You know, and most of us have heard that it's it's put out there for you know some some control originally it was to control the the masses to some extent but it's it can be very comforting to feel that if we do uh, a certain a beneficial action that we can go to a place called heaven you know and and live out our and and live there impermanently with our cats and dogs and <laughs> and family or whatever you know whatever he heaven is to us, um, and of course the 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 the, the Buddhist view is that um, the to come back in, into life again like this rebirth isn't necessarily a good thing. Um, there we were talking the other night about the Bodhisattva. Where they take a vow, like the Dalai Lama takes a vow to come back and help sentient beings uh, to reach enlightenment, so that we can kind of all get out of this at the same time, you know. But in the Theravada tradition, there there is no. Uh, it's more of following the Buddha's footsteps, uh, uh, how he how he lived his life, uh, he, and he didn't take these these when once he became enlightened. He, he said there was no more rebirth in samsara, you know, this, this world that we live in now. And so we know from experience, well, we know from, uh, from studying and, and, and that kind of, you know, reading and things and, and being here that our next rebirth isn't necessarily a good one, you know, because there is, when we're born into this world, we're all actually signing a contract that we're going to age and get sick and die, you know. And again and again and again, it happens. You know, it's like we, we take on that responsibility. Okay, I'm reborn. I'm going to die. I'm reborn. You know, it's just like Groundhog Day almost, right? <coughs> and so, a, a big part of that, uh, of course, is karma because that's really our saving grace. If we um, live uh, a wholesome life and we can experience you know, uh, a, a welcome, you know, we can experience a welcoming um, uh, a life or uh, actions in the future that we um, look forward to, you know, that we wish for. And if we don't live a wholesome life and have an unwholesome activities of some sort, um, we kind of pay the penalty. And it doesn't have to happen right away, but it could happen next life or even, you know, life lives, several lives down. It doesn't have to mature within this one lifetime. And the wonderful thing um, about karma is that it explains selflessness and emptiness really, really well for us. Well, okay, it's more important to teach Westerners <laughs> uh, about karma than about emptiness. That's what the Dalai Lama said. And the reason being is because em uh, karma does explain emptiness in itself. You know, we have these, um, we, we, we build this, what we call, we can call our, uh, our character, you know, based on wholesomeness and unwholesomeness. And this character is you know in the especially in the West is is what we consider ourselves you know like a good um, you know a, 
a wholesome character or, you know, like this guy's a real character, he's a bank robber, you know, and uh, immediately we think that, that, you know, the negativity of being a bank robber. But if we, uh, if we think of an individual and we had some, uh, some practices like this, I think a couple weeks ago where we saw the individual with all of their baggage, you know, with their, with their actions from the past and their, their, where they are in life now, you know, financially and their relationships and everything. And we start f forming these ideas about this person's character. And we can actually do that f to ourselves too, where we, we see ourselves without, you know, completely stripped of past or future or anything and, uh, you know, how we live our lives. And then we can also see us of how we, you know, how our, our world is and how we, um, you know, we can see our, the things that we've done in the past and, and how we feel about our future and, again, financially and relationships that we're involved in. And all of a sudden we, we kind of are, are forming this character, you know, of ourselves. And we can feel good about ourselves or we can feel bad about ourselves based on our character. And um, the, so basically, uh, character is a person's wholesomeness or unwholesomeness, which has a lot to do with, with karma. And, you know, we want to keep in mind that karma is not really a set of, uh, necessarily a set of rules that we're supposed to follow. But it's, it, it's a, um, you know, if we, it, it said that if we are, live a mindful life, just, just being mindful, period, that we will live a wholesome life. Because we, because we know better, you know, we know the differences and how, uh, how, we're, how we behave, you know, how, how we should act with, with this agreement of being in the world. So the, basically, the, you know, the end of karma is when, when we become uh, awakened or enlightened to, to whatever degree. Um, when we realize non-self, there's still, there's still karma there because we're processing that, continually processing the idea of self. Sometimes we go, yeah, there is no self. I remember being in Thailand, this guy, he's so funny. I was getting something standing in line. We're not supposed to talk. And he looked up at me and he goes, no Joe. There's no Joe. <laughs> his, name was, his name was Joe. And he goes, no Joe. And, uh, <laughs> and for, for that moment, <laughs> for that moment, Joe was seeing the ultimate truth. And then later on after the retreat, I was at Joe's house and he was not seeing the ultimate truth. He was seeing the relative truth. He was showing me his, his house and stuff like that. But when, when the self falls away, you know, like I said, the, uh, it's actually a, a time of non-doing. Uh, and we can do that in meditation. We get that, feel like that there's nothing happening. Like we're not doing anything, so we're not creating any karma. And th that happens in, in when we have these, this ultimate view. Thing, everything stops, you know. And then when we go back into the relative view, we start planning, you know, and you know, thinking about pa you know past and future and uh, relationships and money and, and all these things that ha has to be a part of the, our life. But uh, the idea is to know the, how these what is happening in these two different views, and all of us have experienced it. But it, the, the key is to, to understand why that is happening. We'll be talking about more about that as we go you know, throughout, the, throughout the program here.